Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this week's Algebraic Graph Theory Seminar. This week, uh, Andrew Gina, he's going to tell us about quantum algorithm and mutually unbiased basis. Awesome. Uh, so thank you for inviting me, Sabrina and Tina, um, and the whole Algebraic Graph Theory contingent. Uh, as Tina said, my name is Andrew Jenna. I'm at the University of Waterloo. Uh, my advisor is Michele Mosca, who's in the audience. Um, and I mainly study quantum algorithms. So I apologize to all the algebraic graph theorists that you know this isn't really my regular field of study. Um, but during my master's thesis, I found what I thought was a, some very interesting results. Um, I proved it all kind of from scratch. And it was only afterwards that I found out that like, oh, this is related to you know things that people have studied already with mutual unbiased species. Um, so what I ended up doing was contributing new proofs to our already known results. Um, so we're just going to go over kind of my thought process, how I stumbled into this, um, and then possibly how some of these new things could be used in the future, um, whether they have any utility at all. So we'll jump right into it with um, the introduction, which, you know, first we'll start with poly matrices and Clifford circuits, just a, a quick introduction to what little amount of quantum algorithm stuff you guys will need to know for this talk. Um, and then we'll talk about the question of partitioning Pauli strings. <clears throat> and from what I can tell, this was first proposed in 2001 um, for its, its relation to mutually unbiased species. Uh, so once we talk about that problem in full, we'll go on to, to show like, indeed, how does this relate to mutually unbiased species? And from there, we'll take everything that we've done, you know, mod two over these binary fields um, and extend it to qubits, which are, you know, prime power fields. And that is kind of the, the full extent of this problem of proving this for, you know, prime powers. So proving the already known result that there exist D to the N plus one mutual unbiased species in the field C to the D. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk about, you know, a conclusion. And if we have a little bit of extra time, I can share some, some nice graphs that I had um, for, for something that I actually recently found out from a question that was asked to me on, on Reddit a few weeks ago. Um, but we'll begin with the quantum states. And the definition of a quantum state is a d-dimensional um, normalized complex vector in C to the d. Um, so unfortunately, uh, I've been co-opted by the physicists, and I now use the, the bracket or Dirac notation. Uh, I find that this is the, the easiest way to work with these things over um, for quantum algorithms research. Uh, so I'll be using it. But just as a quick refresher for what it means, uh, if you have some complex vector phi naught to phi to the d minus one, um, you can split that into the, the standard basis vectors phi naught times the first standard basis vector plus so on. And in the end, you get a, a summation over phi i, and then we have these things. These are called kets, uh, so the ket of i. So i just indicates like the, the ith standard, standard basis vector. And we could also just write you know, the ket of phi if we want to use a shorthand. Um, and then, as I said, these things are normalized. So the two norm is equal to one, or the sum over the norm squared of these, these entries is equal to one. And then a quantum algorithm is something which maps one quantum state to another, and it preserves the two norm. Um, so from this, we get into this idea of quantum measurements. And you'll understand quickly why quantum measurements are useful for us, um, or why they're important for this talk, uh, because it turns out that commuting sets of Pauli's can be simultaneously measured. Um, but to get to that point, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what happens when you actually try to measure a quantum state. So the probability is given by this inner product, and then you take the, the norm squared, right? So if I'm measuring a state phi, I can measure it in any other basis, and one of those basis vectors, it can, it can end up looking like that basis vector, collapsing to that basis vector with probability, this inner product norm squared. Um, so in particular, if we're measuring in the computational basis, which for algorithms is, is normally what we'll be doing, um, you can collapse the state phi to the standard basis vector, the ket k, with this probability. Um, and when you actually write out phi as the summation over the phi i, the complex coefficients, uh, the only term which isn't isn't zero or con contributes something non-zero to the sum um, is the phi k term. So essentially, when you when you represent something in the standard basis, um, you just get the norm squared of the coefficient is the probability of of measuring it to be in that state. Um, but moving on from this, we can talk a little bit more about the quantum algorithms part of this. Uh, so hopefully this is all, you know, some uh, some linear algebra that you guys already know. Uh, but I will mention the kind of, I guess, weird or, or maybe peculiar um, physics notation of using this U dagger uh, for the conjugate transpose. But unitaries are, you know, matrices such that the conjugate transpose is equal to its inverse. 
and Hermitians are matrices such that the conjugate transpose is equal to itself. Um, and then we get this fact that a matrix preserves the two-norm of complex vectors if and only if it is unitary. Um, so in other words, all quantum algorithms are unitary matrices. Um, and then this last fact, this one that ends up being really important for, for what we're going to be discussing, is that every unitary matrix U can be written as the exponentiation of a Hermitian matrix H, right? So you can write U equals E to the I H. And when I first got into like the quantum algorithms side of things, or like the quantum mechanics, I guess, of it all, um, this E to the I H was always confusing to me. And I always felt that it was easier if I just write it out as the, the summation, the, the Taylor series or power series or whatever it's called. Um, and you get the I to the N or N factorial times H to the power of N. Um, so it turns out that for every unitary, there exists some Hermitian like this. And these Hermitians oftentimes are called Hamiltonians, or at least in, in the chemistry side of things, uh, the field that I work in, they'll give me a Hamiltonian and I'm gonna try to like decompose it into commuting sets of Paulis. And the Hamiltonian will be written as a sum over poly operators. Um, and the reason we can do that is this next fact that'll come up, right? So um, the two by two Pauli matrices are as follows. We have the identity matrix, just the normal two by two identity. Um, and we're going to call that x to the zero times z to the zero. Um, x, which is just the, it's like a transposition. It's a swap gate, essentially, or it, um, a not gate. Uh, and it has x to the one, z to the zero. At the bottom here, you have z, which is a diagonal operator, which imparts a phase on the, the second, I guess, the second basis vector. So x to the zero, z to the one. And then y, which is just x times z, and then a multiple of i in order to make sure that the the basis or the uh, the matrix ends up being Hermitian. And the nice thing is that poly matrices form a basis for the real vector space of two by two Hermitian matrices. So for any Hermitian matrix H, you can write as a sum AI plus BX plus CY plus DZ, um, where all of these coefficients are real. And it turns out that if you take tensor products of the poly matrices, um, then this is true for any two to the N by two to the N Hermitian matrix. Um, and so, in general, what I will do is I will assume that I'm given a Hamiltonian or Hermitian, right, in, in my field of work, uh, as already decomposed as a sum of, you know, real coefficients and Pauli operators. So um, the last thing that we'll need is symplectic representation. Um, now, this comes from at least quantum error correction is where I first saw symplectic notation. I don't know if that's where it was originally invented. Um, but what you can do is if you ignore overall phases in the Pauli group, um, you can represent Pauli matrices in this, this nice notation where the identity gets mapped to 0, 0, x gets mapped to 1, 0, y gets mapped to 1, 1, and z gets mapped to, to 0, 1, right? And we just use this bar into middle to differentiate the, I guess, the x part, the left part, and the, the z part, the right part of these symplectic vectors. Um, and what you can do is you can take Pauli strings, which are tensor products of Pauli matrices, and represent them in vectors, right? So i tensor x tensor y tensor z. Um, or we'll just call it the string i x y z for simplicity uh, would map to you know you get a zero and a zero on the leftmost bit of both of these you get a one and a zero for the x on the second one a one one for the y and then a zero one for the z um, and similarly if you have a set of poly string or I guess maybe a list because you you want them to maintain their order uh, they can be represented by symplectic matrices right so you just get a, a mapping something like that and these matrices kind of make life pretty easy to work with when it comes to decomposing these things. Um, so the reason in particular that they're so easy to work with is because the symplectic inner product is easy to define, right? And I guess from Lie algebras, whatever, um, this is measuring the commutator or telling you something about the commutator of these two Pauli operators. So if you represent the Paulis as x1, xn, so an x vector and a z vector and another x vector and another z vector, the symplectic inner product is defined to be this, this summation, right? So you have x1j times z2j. So you take, you know, all the multiples up from this x vector times the z vector of the second one, and you subtract z from the first one times x from the second one, right? So if you treat these as vectors, you can just take the dot product of the x part with the z part and subtract the dot product of the z part of the x part. Um, and then all of this you do mod two. Now you might be wondering, why did I include a minus sign if this is all mod two, right? That seems unnecessary. Uh, but in the end, once we extend this to qubits, so we're working over, you know, prime fields, uh, it turns out that minus is the correct choice, right, instead of plus. Um, but this symplectic inner product can tell you when P1 and P2 commute. So two Pauli's commute, if and only if their symplectic inner product is zero. In other words, the, the commutator is equal to either the identity or, or minus identity. Um, 
and a set of poly operators, um, which is defined by the symplectic matrix, X part on the left, Z part on the left, on the right. Oops. Uh, so these are two matrices. Uh, it pairwise commutes if and only if X times Z transpose is symmetric. Um, so if you went through and checked all of the symplectic inner products, you would find that this is a you know, sufficient and necessary condition um, for every pair of these operators to be commuting. And then the question really should be, why are we dealing with polys? Why are we taking all this time to set up this framework? Um, and from a quantum algorithms point of view, from the, the type of like NISC device algorithms that, are, that I work with, um, we have this nice property that if our emission H is an eigenvector eigenvalue pair, phi, and then lambda, then the expectation of H with respect to phi is equal to lambda. Now, this is just the definition of a um, eigenvector and its corresponding eigenvalue. Uh, but importantly for us, we can write H as a sum of Pauli strings, H equals sum over I, C, I, P, I, right? And by the linearity of expectation values, um, you can pull out the sum over I and the coefficients. So all you're left with is to calculate the expectation on each of these Pauli operators, right? And it turns out that when when the input to this, when you're taking the expectation of some state with something that's diagonal, then you get just a sum of plus or minus these coefficients squared. And as I said before, you can figure out what these coefficients are squared because when you're measuring the quantum state in the computational basis, you're getting, you know, you collapse to a certain state with this probability, you know, phi i squared. So if you can figure out what phi i squared is by repeatedly measuring and then figure out whether you're in the positive or negative, like plus one or minus one eigenbasis, um, for a given poly operator, then you can reconstruct this expectation value by averaging over these over these values. Um, so if we have a poly operator that's diagonal, or any diagonal operator for that matter, um, you can estimate this expectation value just by measuring in the uh, in the computational basis. And then the question is, well, what if it's not diagonal? Right? Like, what do we do in that case? Uh, in general, it's hard to diagonalize. You know, these two to the n by two to the n matrices. Uh, but for poly operators, there's actually more we can do. And to do that, we need Clifford's. Um, so I'm going to define this just Clifford circuit. You can use a lot of different notation for this. Um, but if a unitary is in the normalizer of the poly group, so in other words, if it maps a poly operator to another poly operator, right, and never goes outside of this group. Um, and this is the mapping is all done by conjugation, right? So you do H, the poly, and then H transpose or conjugate transpose, or S, the poly, S conjugate transpose, right? Um, so we'll call this a Clifford circuit, and it can be generated by the following Clifford gates. Right? So you have a Hadamard, which is, um, this is just a scaled version of the, the Hadamard matrices that many of you guys were probably familiar with. Um, you have the S gate, which is a phase gate, which just imparts a phase of I on the, you know, the second standard basis vector. And then a C naught, which is like a controlled knot operation, where it doesn't do anything to the first bit. Um, but if the first bit is zero, it doesn't change. If the first bit is one, then it flips the second bit. Um, so these are kind of three easy matrices to work with. Um, and it turns out that any Clifford circuit can be generated by you know, successive application of these matrices on various different qubits. Also, I guess, tensor product with the, the identity matrix. So um, the nice thing about the Clifford circuits um, is that we can actually tell how they're acting on the Paulis efficiently, right? So this was proved, it's called like the Gottesman nil theorem um, in quantum algorithms. Uh, but essentially what you can do is um, once you figure out how each of these gates acts on poly operators, you can just like take a set of poly operators, run it through each of the gates one by one, and you can just you know, have a starting state, have a finishing state, and you can, you can trace it the whole way through. Um, so X and Z is a generating set of the one qubit poly strings. I mean, we saw that before. Y is just equal to X times Z. Another way of seeing this is that X is one, zero, Z is zero, one, and one, zero and zero, one certainly span the, the complex vectors of dimension two, right? And then XI, IX, ZI, and IZ is a generating set of two qubit poly strings. Um, again, one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, and so on. This is kind of like the standard basis set in our symplectic mapping. Um, and then what we can look at is how do each of these act on poly operators by, um, by conjugation. So H, X, H dagger is equal to Z. So the Hadamard takes X to Z and Z to X. The phase gate takes X to Y and then Z to itself. And this is easy to see because you know S is diagonal, Z is diagonal. Of course, they commute with one another. Um, and then the last one, C naught, 
takes you know poly strings xi, ix, ci, iz. So it maps xi to xx and iz to zz, and then it doesn't change the other two. Um, but by learning and memorizing these, or in fact by just like you know, essentially these are kind of column operations in the symplectic matrices. Um, we can work with you know Clifford's acting on Pauli's in a very efficient way. And the reason why this is so important for measurement is because for any pair of non-identity Pauli strings, P0 and P1, there exists a Clifford circuit C such that P0 is equal to C, P1, C dagger. So in other words, um, you can take any Pauli and map it to any other Pauli by some Clifford. And in fact, for our purposes, at least for from like a implementation point of view, you can actually do so efficiently, which is really important. Um, so in particular, if you're looking at the expectation, right, if I'm trying to measure P0 and I don't really know what to do, what I can do is I can instead measure P1 by taking the C, P1, C dagger. And um, now, if you're not used to the bracket notation, it's a bit confusing that this, you know, this bra of phi with C uh, is equal to, you know, C dagger, keta phi, and then dagger, right? Now that's a bit confusing, but it turns out this is how it works. And essentially what you're saying is that the expectation of P0 with phi is the same thing as the expectation of P1 with respect to the state C dagger times phi. Um, and in particular, what if P1 were diagonal? Well, that means then we can measure C dagger phi in the computational basis and estimate this expectation. But these expectations are equal. So we can measure any non-diagonal poly operator now. Right? Um, so what this tells us is if we have a Hermitian operator, a Hamiltonian in quantum chemistry terms, um, as long as we can write it as a sum of Pauli operators, then we can calculate the expectation just by measuring each of the Pauli operators separately. Uh, but measuring things separately takes a long time. So what if we want to like reuse some of the measurement outcomes? And it turns out that if a set of Paulis are all diagonal, so we have like they're simultaneously diagonal, then repeatedly measuring phi will contribute information about all of their expectations. Now, why is that? Well, I said that you know measuring phi tells you the norm squared of whatever you know, it gives you information about the norm squared of whatever, you know, whatever probability you of uh, collapsing to the state that you found. Um, and all you, all you have to do is for each of the Paulis, check whether it's the plus one or the minus one eigenbasis for that Pauli. So every measurement contributes information for all diagonal Paulis at the same time. So if I have a set of Paulis, if I can diagonalize all of them, we're in really good shape. We can get information about all of them at the same time. Um, so if we can construct such a unitary, which diagonalizes a set of Pauli's, then we can maximize our information, right? Um, and it turns out that a, a modified Gaussian elimination algorithm, right? As I said, Clifford's are kind of like column operations, right? So if you do some sort of like um, fancy symplectic uh, column Gaussian elimination, um, you can show that a, a diagonalized Clifford circuit exists if and only if the set of Pauli's is pairwise commuting, right? And now we see, oh, this is why we care about pairwise commuting sets because it allows us to measure things efficiently. Um, and then this is where my research uh, during my master's and certainly during my PhD is kind of taken two different turns. Um, the first is the implementation side of things where I've written tons of algorithms to efficiently split up Hamiltonians in these ways to, to measure them, to, you know, um, to do all these mappings on them and to kind of optimize different algorithms with these ideas. But on the other side, while I was doing my master's thesis, I had this, like thought in the back of my head from the, the pure math side of me um, that wanted to know how many commuting sets of Pauli strings uh, it would take to partition the set of all four to the n n qubit Pauli strings, right? So if I wanted to partition it into, you know, disjoint maximally commuting sets, uh, is there a way to do that? And if so, how many of these things are there, right? So this talk is going to deal with the, the kind of more theoretical question and the more pure math side of things. So the number of non-identity Pauli strings is four to the n minus one. Now, four to the n just comes from, there are four Paulis. You can take a tensor product n different times, right? So there are four options n times four to the n. Um, and we ignore the identity, the i tensor i tensor i, um, because that commutes with everything. So we don't really care about it, right? We're going to pretend it doesn't exist and we'll, we'll deal with it later. We can just throw it into all of the sets or none of the sets at the end. Um, and then you see that the largest set of non-identity commuting Pauli strings is two to the n minus one. Now, um, an easy way of seeing this is to look at the the kind of like the standard basis, like z tensor i tensor i, i tensor z tensor i, i tensor i tensor z, right? So all the combinations of i's and z's. 
and ask, is there anything else which commutes with that, right? Well, I can get like anything that has I's and Z's, anything else that's diagonal, but are there any non-diagonal polys that commute? And the answer is no, right? Um, and what happens is essentially every time you include a new like linearly independent poly operator, which commutes, um, you split the eigenbasis from before it was like plus one on half of the set, minus one on half of the set. When you do it again, you get a quarter have plus and plus, a quarter have plus and minus, and so on and so forth. Um, and then each time you add a new one, you split the, the eigenbasis up. And once you get n of these things, um, and then you take the span, so to the n of these things, uh, it turns out that nothing else can commute with all of those poly strings. Um, and as I said at the bottom here, we find this we find this basis n, and that's going to be important for a few slides from now. Um, but then we see that, well, ideally, if we can partition these four to the n minus one non-identity poly strings into sets of size two to the n minus one, then you would expect there to be two to the n plus one parts, right? And the question is, is this bound achievable? And what we're going to do is we're going to assume we achieve this bound, right? And we're going to use this notation. And then hopefully at the end, we'll actually show that we can construct these partitions in this way. Um, so we start with this math cal C naught up to C two to the n. Um, and then by the diagonalization argument, we can actually diagonalize C naught, right? So as I said, there's some Clifford. And if we apply that Clifford to all of these Paulis, right? It just maps Paulis to Paulis. So that's kind of fine. Um, but in particular, we can choose one that diagonalizes this first set, right? And as I said, instead of representing all two to the n minus one of these, we can just represent a basis of n of them. And a nice basis for the diagonal Pauli strings is Z I I I, I Z I I, et cetera. Um, and in symplectic notation, this just looks like the, the zero n by n zero matrix and the n by n identity matrix, right? So we can say that like, oh, we can map C naught to, to this basis. And that's all well and good, um, but what can we do with the rest of these, right? We're, we're not even one to the nth of the way there. Um, but with C naught set to this, then what we can show is that every other part must be independent over the left side of the symplectic vector, right? Um, and a way, a way to see this is, imagine you had two of these polys, xxi and xxz or something. Uh, if you compose them, so if you multiply those polys or if you add them in symplectic notation, um, since every all the math is done mod two, the xx cancel out to i, another xx cancel out to i, and the iz just goes to z. So what you're left with is iiz, which is a diagonal operator. But c naught contains all of the diagonal operators, right? So we can't get another diagonal operator anywhere else. So in other words, um, you must have a full rank matrix on the left hand side, and if we can just choose the basis, why not choose the identity matrix as our full rank basis, right? Um, so without loss of generality, we can define or we can map CI to the basis, which has identity on the left, and then some, some matrix on the right, AI. Um, and we've reduced the problem finding these sets to this problem of choosing matrices with some properties. And the next slide, we'll talk about what those properties are. So we ask what properties must these matrices, matrices satisfy? And the first one is that AI must be symmetric. Right? So if you remember back at the beginning, I said that um, if things are pairwise commuting, um, if a set of polys is pairwise commuting, then the left-hand side, the X part, multiplied by the transpose of the right part must be a symmetric matrix. Well, if the left side is the identity, then that means the right side must itself be symmetric. Um, so that's where this comes from. Another way of seeing that is to actually go through the computation and take the symplectic inner product between all pairs of rows. And you can end up showing that, you know, it happens if and only if these AIs are symmetric. So we know that we're looking for symmetric matrices. Um, but this other condition is a bit more confusing, right? We have AI minus AJ, AJ must be invertible for all I not equal to J. Um, and the reason that this happens is because um, otherwise you could write, you know, you could take some span or take some linear combination of the elements in AI and take the same linear combination of the elements in AJ. And at some point they would be equal to one another, right? In order to get a zero vector in the span of AI minus AJ, um, you could write some linear combination here that's equal to some linear combination here. Um, and the problem from there is that, well, when I take those things together, um, you're going to find that they, they collide on that point. Um, and these sets need to be disjoint, right? If we want to split it up into all parts of equal sizes, then it needs to be like a true partition where these things are all disjoint. Um, so 
this condition is our, our second. And it turns out these are the only two conditions for these matrices. And moreover, there's one more trick we can do, um, which is that there's a modified diagonalization ar argument, which only uses Clifford gates that don't change the diagonal basis, right? So they map i's and z's to other i's and z's without x's and y's showing up. Um, and in doing so, we can actually choose a1 to be equal to the n by n zero matrix, right? So that saves us a little bit more trouble. We have, you know, zero identity, identity zero, and then to the n minus one other matrices, right? And now we know that each of these matrices minus zero must be invertible. So all of these matrices are also invertible. So we're looking for symmetric invertible matrices such that their difference is invertible. And we need a full set of two to the n minus one of these. Um, and then kind of, this is the problem we were left with. And I thought about this for a very, very long time um, until I, I started testing it out on small examples on like the two qubit case, the three qubit case, and then for like, you know, prime dimensions that were larger. And I found this property that for the sets that I could develop just by guessing and checking and working my way there, um, they actually satisfy this type cyclic property. Um, and I was actually able to capture that with this idea of Singer cycles. So if we let GLND, the general linear group on you know, a finite field of size D and n dimensions, uh, be the group of n by n invertible matrices over you know, C mod D um, with ordinary matrix multiplication as the, the operation, then we can define a Singer cycle to be an element of GLND of multiplicative order D to the n minus one. Right, so it, this is like the, the largest you could hope for a multi, the multiplicative order to be. Um, it's actually some some matrix that kind of like spans the whole set in some way. Um, and it turns out that a Singer cycle exists for all GLND, right? For any for any dimension you choose, and for any prime d that you choose, um, you can uh, a, you know a Singer cycle always exists. And in fact, one can be constructed by taking the companion matrix of a primitive polynomial of degree n in the finite field of Dimension D, the polynomials over that finite field. Um, and this companion matrix, well, for me at first, it was just a nice way of proving that these things exist. I looked online, I was looking for proofs because you know Singer cycles aren't weren't invented by me. Um, and I found this proof using a companion matrix. But it turns out that the companion matrix is matrix is actually the perfect thing for us to use because they satisfy some really nice properties. And in particular, we have three facts. The first is that a Singer cycle, any any matrix which is similar to a Singer cycle is also a Singer cycle, right? You can see this just by checking whether these things are distinct. And these things are distinct if and only if the powers of S were already distinct. Um, so, so you get other, other similar matrices satisfy the same properties. The second is that if you take a companion matrix, then the powers C to the I minus C to the J always is some invertible matrix, right? And a nice way of thinking about this is um, multiplying by a companion matrix of a primitive polynomial is the same thing as multiplying by x when you're working in this, you know, this field of polynomials mod mod the primitive that you're working with. Um, and so multiplying by c to the i is like multiplying by x to the i. Multiplying by c to the j is like multiplying by x to the j. Right? So this is really like saying x to the i minus x to the j is some non-zero polynomial, right? Um, and, and that's that's all this is really saying. Um, then the last step is if C is the companion matrix or permanent polynomial, then there exists some, you know, some invertible matrix such that B, C, B inverse is symmetric, right? And this is something that I didn't prove on my own. In fact, like the proof for it was too long for me to even include in my thesis. So I'm not gonna, certainly not gonna include it here. Um, but this is kind of the last step I needed, right? Because we have, we have Singer cycles. We know that similar matrices are also similar uh, Singer cycles. We know that they satisfy this nice invertibility thing if we're choosing the, the companion matrix. Um, and then combining all of this, and now we have you know, a symmetric Singer cycle, uh, we end up getting something that satisfies both you know, invertibility, symmetricity, and then the, the differences being invertible. So in other words, we found a minimal partition, right? This gives us a way of, I mean, assuming we can calculate this matrix B, of actually, um, I'm actually describing a, a minimal partition of the, the set of poly operators into commuting sets, right? Uh, and that, so now the question is, well, that's all well and dandy, but what does that have to do with mutually unbiased spaces? Uh, so we'll start with this definition. Uh, so a mutually unbiased basis, uh, or two bases, phi 1 to phi d, 
and psi one to psi d um, are mutually unbiased if and only if the inner product between any pair of vectors that you might choose in these bases is one over the square root of d for all i and j. Um, and what this is essentially saying is that the reason why this is important for like quantum information theory, um, quantum state tomography, and quantum key distribution in particular, um, is that if I prepare a state in one of these bases, and then you measure it in another basis, the information you get, or you basically get no information from that measurement, right? Because one of these vectors is written as like a, you know, the linear combination of exactly the same amounts, the same probability distribution from vectors from the other basis. Um, so what this is saying is, is you basically, if you if you prepare one thing, you get no information if you prepare another thing in another state. Um, and I'll explain really quickly on the next slide how they use that in quantum key distribution. Um, and it turns out that you know if you have a maximal set of commuting Pauli strings, you get a unique basis of the joint eigenvectors. As I said, like each time you get the the eigenvectors, the, the eigenbases, the dimensions of them goes down and down and down until you have like, you know, each one is uniquely identified. Uh, and so this gives us the idea, what if we look at the eigenbases of our commuting sets of Pauli's? Um, by some miracle, do they happen to be mutually unbiased? And it turns out that, that yes, that is indeed the case. So we can check that for this really simple set, right? So two commuting sets, iz and ix. Right. This is like a one qubit example, so it's about as easy as it can get. The, the eigenbasis for i and z is cat zero, cat one, and the eigenbasis for i and x. So if you do quantum algorithms, you recognize these as like cat plus and cat minus, or zero plus one over root two, zero minus one over root two. Um, and you can verify that the inner products of all of these have norm one over root two, right? Just by looking at these inner products. Um, in this case, you get a negative, but we only care about the norm, so, so that's all right. Um, and using this property that a bra and a cat on like this on a basis are is essentially equal to the Kronecker delta of whether you know zero is equal to zero, but zero is not equal to one. So it only contributes a one over root two to this to the sum. Um, and then this is actually the basis that is used in it's called the BB84 protocol for um, for quantum key distribution. Uh, the idea is that someone will prepare a state either a zero or a one. Or a plus or a minus. And by preparing one of these four states, if someone is eavesdropping and trying to measure it, right? If you measure the wrong one, you you end up getting no information. Out. And in fact, if you measure the wrong one and then someone else tries to measure it again, they can tell that you eavesdropped with probability one half, right? So the norm squared of this. And the reason why we care about mutually unbiased spaces is they maximize that probability of catching an eavesdropper. Right? So you can use any two distinct bases you wanted, but the probability is maximized when the bases are mutually unbiased. Um, so that's kind of how, how this comes into play in like a quantum information theory point of view. Um, so it turns out that we can take this one qubit example and extend it to poly strings. Right? So if you have you know, things that are always i and z, so all the diagonal polys, and then things that are always i and x, so these are like diagonal in the x basis in some way of looking at it. Um, what you can do is you can take the fact that a Hadamard matrix, the n-fold tensor product of the Hadamard matrix, H tensor n, uh, maps iz to ix, right? So as we saw before, H takes z to x, and H takes x to z. Um, and if I take an n-fold tensor product, it maps like izzi to ixxi, and vice versa. Um, so since this Hadamard is mapping between these sets, all we have to do is look at the, you know, the norms of the entries in this n-fold tensor product. And the norms of those entries is one over root two to the n, right? Now, this is actually pretty similar to like the standard way of defining uh, mutually unbiased species using like whale operators, um, where they'll start with these two sets. And then from this fact, they'll use whale operators to like build, build more mutually unbiased species. Um, and that just all comes down to, to this fact that, that these norms, you know, the Hadamard matrix has entries which are all the same norm. And so the n-fold intense product still satisfies that property. And that norm must be one over root two to the n. Otherwise, otherwise it would add up to something larger than one. Like the probabilities just wouldn't work out. And so before we conclude, um, it's important to, to then take this. We've, we've proved a bunch of things for dimension two to the n. Um, but to take those to dimension d, um, 
so that we can like you know state state this with some finality right so in quantum computation um you can define quantum states on c to the d as i did in the first slide um, in particular we can actually generalize the Pauli operators so they're called the clock and shift matrices sometimes also called like sylvester matrices um where shift the you know, these are backwards i suppose but shift matrix xd is essentially it's like a um you're mapping any ket i to the ket i plus one right and then you do that mod d so the last one ket d minus one gets mapped to ket zero um and then the the clock matrix is essentially just it takes whatever ket you plug in and it applies some phase where omega is e to two pi over d one of the d roots or the d root of unity um and it takes that and it, it raises it to whatever power of the ket that you're in um but moreover while you can also generalize Pauli's, or you can generalize Pauli's, you can also generalize the Clifford circuits, right? And there are multiple ways to generalize the Pauli operators, but this one's the nicest, at least for, for what I do, um, because it also generalizes the Cliffords. Um, and for our purposes, we're only going to need the q to equivalent of the H gate, right? Now, this isn't a generalized Hadamard matrix. Um, Sabrina made sure that I, I should probably mention that, right? And this is instead a discrete Fourier transform, right? So the generalization of Hadamard is a discrete Fourier transform, and that looks like this, right? So you just get omega to the power of whatever the entries are. So up here, it's all zeros times things, right? On the left-hand side, it's all zeros times other things, right? Uh, but all of these are just omega to the whatever the entry is, you know, the I guess the uh, the coordinates of the the entry. And the important thing is that all of these have norm one, and then the whole thing is scaled by one over square root of d. Um, and the nice thing is that this satisfies the equations we'd expect, right? So it takes x to z and it takes z to x. But importantly, it's not quite x, it's x inverse or mod d, x to the d minus one. Um, and this is a bit weird. And you might think, well, why didn't we just choose a matrix such that it mapped x to z and z to x? And it turns out that that's actually impossible, right? Because these Cliffords, satisfy certain properties that they have to maintain the symplectic inner product. And because that symplectic inner product had a negative rather than a positive, uh, you actually need the inverse to show up on one of these sides, right? So no, ma no matter what we chose, you were going to get a either ZD inverse or XD inverse. Mm -hmm. We just chose to define it this way. Um, but either way, these Hadamards, these phase gates, these C0 gates um, all generalize to time you know, prime fields, and then taking tensor products, you can do prime powers. So again, you can take the IC basis, the IX basis. Um, these have eigenbases, which are mutually unbiased, because the entries of the n-fold tensor product of the quantum Fourier transform has norm 1 over root d to the n, right? And since we were careful to define a Singer cycle, not over just mod 2, but over any, you know, prime d, um, we can actually use the same argument but from before to construct a set of d to the n plus one disjoint maximal commuting sets of Pauli strings, right? So now that we have that, and we have this fact that, well, at least two of these sets produce mutually unbiased eigenbases, um, we'll see really quickly that those two are enough because the diagonalization argument from before allowed us to map any Clifford to a diagonal set. And then it also allowed us to map any other Clifford to the IX basis, right? So diagonal and X basis. And we showed that these are have mutually unbiased eigenbases. But since Cliffords are unitary, they preserve the inner products of the vectors in these eigenbases, right? So they preserve the two norm of these things. Um, and in particular, what that means is that if they're mutually unbiased after being transformed by this diagonalizing Clifford, they were also mutually unbiased before being transformed. So any pair of disjoint maximal commuting sets of Pauli strings has mutually unbiased base, eigenbases. So our d to the n plus one disjoint actually commuting sets define d to the n plus one mutually unbiased bases of c d to the n, right? So when I found this out, I thought this was so cool and I went looking for it. And it turns out I was not the first one to come up with it, right? Some of these proofs are, are distinct, um, but as I said, back in 2001 was the first time that someone connected Pauli operators, or at least the first time I can find, that someone connected Pauli operators to mutually unbiased bases. Um, but one thing I haven't seen is the use of Singer cycles, right? So I, I noticed this kind of cyclic nature of it. And I have seen a few papers that mention Singer cycles, but they haven't used them in this way to construct these Pauli operators. 
Um, and I also tend to rely very heavily on quivered circuits, right? So polystrings contain this, you know, really rich structure. They form this real basis of Hermitian matrices. So they're really nice in those ways. Um, but a lot of kind of like the nice symmetries and the nice hidden structure can only be unlocked once you can map between sets of polys using Clifford operators. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, I've taken that motto um, or I've, I've taken that idea and I've kind of made that my motto for my PhD research. And while my PhD research has not continued looking at mutually unbiased spaces, uh, similar techniques of finding sets of poly operators, finding Cliffords which diagonalize them or act on them in certain ways, and then figuring out what that says about the set that you started with um, has been crucially important to everything that I've researched. Um, and I am hopeful that like, you know, while, while I didn't prove anything new um, and while I didn't, you know, I didn't actually like, you know, all of my proofs were, were things that are just restatements of things that had come before. Um, I am hopeful that, you know, this provides some small addition by connecting Singer cycles and relying on Clifford circuits rather than just the poly operators themselves um, is a step in the right direction towards verifying the number of mutually unbiased spaces over composite dimensions. And since I have a couple minutes left, I also included a discussion a little bit about those composite dimensions, um, where why does this proof not work? for composite dimensions, right? And by composite, I just mean like, instead of prime powers, I mean things that are not prime powers. So anything where there are two different primes in the um, in the prime factorization. Uh, and it turns out that, well, over composite dimensions, poly matrices and Clifford gates can be defined like normal. They work very well. Everything kind of works out. But the problem is that Singer cycles don't, right? They don't exist since, you know, there's no finite field which has the order of that composite dimension. But what you could do instead is you can split the composite dimension as like a tensor product of prime dimensions. And on each prime dimension, you get to find poly matrices and you have like these local Singer cycles. And I was hopeful that that would, you know, maybe that, that tells you something about it. But the problem is that Clifford gates can't map between qubits of different dimensions, right? So if I'm, you know, if I'm controlling based on a, a qubit and I'm targeting a Q trit or like a Q quint or, you know, some, some larger dimension qubit, um, you run into this problem where there's no way to maintain the symplectic inner product. So Clifford gates aren't well-defined over these composite dimensions. Um, so the diagonalization arguments that I came up with no longer apply, and I'm sure some of the other proofs in here fall apart. Um, so this really only works from what I can tell on prime powers. And unfortunately, like I'm, I'm not really sure what more can be said about that. Um, but I did think of, you know, as I mentioned, someone on Reddit asked a question just a couple weeks ago. Um, and I was answering it by looking at like the periodicities of Clifford circuits. And I found actually that those can be used as another proof and another way of generating these mutually unbiased spaces. Um, so I thought it was pretty interesting. So I figured while I still have a little bit of time, I could talk about it. Um, what you can do is you can encode a Singer cycle as a linear reversible circuit. Um, and you can attain some Clifford of C naught gates and the periodicity is D to the N minus one because the Singer cycle has that period. Um, and so what you do is you define, you know, you end up still getting that I's and Z's are mapped to I's and Z's and I's and X's are mapped to I's and X's because C-naughts maintain that. Um, but you now get these set of matrices where if you look at all of the AI matrices, they're symmetric, but they're symmetric about the reverse diagonal. And this comes from the fact that, you know, a C-naught takes XI to XX, but it takes IZ to ZZ, right? So it maps from X, it maps forward, and from Z, it maps backwards. So you end up getting this like reverse symmetry. Um, but all you need to do is like, you know, sure we can't find a Clifford to map these things to one another. Um, but classically what we can do is we can fix the X part and just reverse the order of the qubits in the Z part. And you get something that is no longer symmetric about the reverse diagonal, but is symmetric about the, the regular diagonal. Um, so this is like a weird backwards way of generating. And I believe this generates, if not the same, uh, mutually unbiased species, it generates very similar mutually unbiased species. Um, but because of these properties, you can actually do this. And the only reason I really included this was it lends itself to like somewhat nice graphs. And here I'm just like, I'm showing how the Clifford acts on poly operators, right? So I, I take this two qubit Clifford, right? And I act on XI and it takes XI to IX and it takes IX to XX. And then it takes XX to XI and so on. So it creates this cycle of like three. Um, and it, as I said, it maintains the I's and the Z's, but it creates these three other cycles. And by reversing the Z parts in these three cycles, you get commuting sets 
which are then, you know, define their mutually unbiased species. And you can do this for, you know, for larger things for, I believe this works for, for any dimension. Here it is um, with period seven on the, you know, the three qubit examples, essentially. Again, all the X's are together, all the Z's are together, and the rest of these can be can be reversed to create commuting sets. Um, so I just thought that was a, a pretty interesting another way of using Clifford's. And I'm I'm optimistic that there are there are even more ways to, to connect Clifford's and mutually unbiased species. So I think with that, I'm done and I'm open for questions. Thank you guys. Thank you, Andrew. That's a very nice talk. Um, so any question for Andrew? Yeah. Um, you might want to talk to Chris Gotzel at Waterloo, who's an expert on the fact that there are many other constructions for MUBs uh, using things other than the finite field, which is implicit in the same notion as uh, um, um, Singer cycles. Uh, there are many, many other constructions um, discovered before, I can't pronounce his name, Bandiapa, yep. Bandi, et cetera, uh, and, and, and team uh, discovered them. Uh, Calderbank and others discovered these things in 1997, but didn't call them MUBs. Mm -hmm. um, that's all. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Talk to God still. Yeah, I think um, the more I found, so as I said, I kind of just stumbled across this without really even knowing what mutually unbiased species were before I started. Um, and the more I dug into it, the more I realized that there's just such a rich history of proving this from so many different viewpoints, right? So I'm sure nothing I've done is, you know, extremely novel, right? Um, but it is incredible how, how many ways people have looked at the same problem and come to like the same conclusions. And it gives me optimism that like, eventually someone will find a way to answer the the composite dimension question. But yeah, I'll definitely have to talk to Chris about it. Thank you.